Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study on the Gospel of Mark. It's great to have everybody here that's in the fellowship hall and uh, everybody that's Zooming at home. Uh, I can't, as I mentioned last week, I can't directly Zoom the video from this video that we're going to watch. The best I can do is I can turn my computer to face the screen. And uh, since when I do that, I can't actually see what's being Zoomed. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that I can affect it so that the recording will show it. Um, the best you can do is just listen along and, and uh, you know, that'll have to be good. Before we get started watching the video, I wanna share the introductory uh, from our lesson. So uh, let me see if I can put that on the screen. We're in uh, lesson number three. And uh, this one is titled The Secret of the Kingdom, and it's going to cover Mark chapter 4 and 5. Our theme verse is from Mark 4, 10 through 11. When Jesus was alone, the 12 and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables. So this is going to deal with some parables of Jesus, and you've heard them before. Um Good thing to keep in mind is what we mean by the kingdom of God. They were very familiar with kingdoms back in Jesus' day. There was a lot of those going around. Us, not so much. And from one of my seminary professors, the best way to think of it is not the kingdom of God, but the reign and rule of God, or more specifically, the reign and rule of Christ. When Jesus says he comes to bring the kingdom of God, he's saying the reign and rule of God is in me, and I'm bringing it to you. And this was God's world. He created it. He gives life to everything. However, our falling into sin made Satan the prince of this world. God still rules, but Satan is a usurper. But God is more powerful. So in Christ, you have Jesus bringing his reign and rule back into our hearts and minds. That's where he rules, in our hearts and minds. He's advancing into enemy territory, and he's taking back what was originally his, which is us. That's what we mean when we talk about the kingdom. Our goal is we seek to learn what the secret of the kingdom is, to whom it is revealed, and from whom it is hidden. We also seek to understand what is taught about the kingdom in parables, and why Jesus even used parables to begin with. And we seek to understand how Jesus' miracles provide further evidence to support this secret of the kingdom, or his reign. What's going on here? In previous lessons, we seek that res we, we saw that responses to Jesus can take one of two forms, either faith or opposition. In this lesson, we will see what that means for each group of people with regard to the reign and rule or the kingdom of God and the secret about it that Jesus came to reveal. What does it mean for those that have faith? What does it mean for those that have opposition? And why would opposition to Jesus come? What are you lacking if you oppose Jesus? The Holy Spirit. Okay. Holy Spirit and faith, yeah. That's the state of the world. That's what we're born into. We're born opposed to God and born opposed to Jesus. And it's the Holy Spirit that has to come into our hearts and minds and convert us and turn us to Christ. Otherwise, we live our entire lives opposed to him and God's will. We'll look at uh, Jesus' teaching about the kingdom and about how Jesus displayed his power as Lord and Savior. All right, with that... Let's see if we can get the video on the screen. You gonna go back and get the lights? Yeah. Fair enough. There we go. Oh, well, there we go. Oh. <laughs> I had it and I, I erased it off the screen. So let me find it again. Got a little too excited with my clicking. <laughs> click happy. I got click happy, yeah. And I think it will remember where we left off. Where I had it set up. So. I 
He sent someone in to call him. Almost. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. When he was alone, 12 and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path, where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed, sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, Hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some thirty, some sixty, some a hundred times what was sown. He said to them, Do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. 
Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. Again he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out, and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me! But Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man, and told about the pigs as well. 
Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please, come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Alrighty. Do you want to go turn the lights back on? That's, that's our study for, our video study for now. The end of chapter uh, five.
I knew it. She was going to buy us. The eyeballs. <laughs> All right, what'd you guys think? That was good. A lot in these two chapters, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's Mark. Mark. Mark packs a lot of stuff in. And as we talked about last week, uh, one of his Mark's favorite words is immediately. Immediately this happened. Immediately Jesus did this. Immediately, immediately, immediately. Um, I really like one of the uh, commentators I read on the book, the book of Mark. It's uh, the yeah. Gospel of Mark is a, a uh, really a passion story. It's about Jesus' passion with an extended introduction. And we start off with Jesus' baptism and he just rushes to the cross. Because in Mark, that's what the important thing is, is Jesus suffering and death and resurrection. But turn to our uh, study guide now. And we're going to begin by going back and rereading uh, Mark chapter 4, verses 1 to 9. Excuse me. If we do, we'll keep this in mind here. Mark recorded that Jesus taught many things in parable. Truth is conveyed in a parable using concrete pictures rather than abstractions. When we attempt to make a point, we sometimes use figures in language to illustrate the point. But usually, the main thrust of our point is made with abstract language. In contrast, parables use figurative language as the main vehicle that conveys the meaning. Parables engage the imagination. They are meant to provoke thought about the point being made and often required effort to understand. The picture language involves the hearing the hearers in the situation and challenges them to apply what is being taught to themselves. I think also what we'd want to look at is parables are used to explain things that are beyond our understanding. In other words, I can't describe to you if you've never seen the Grand Canyon. With my words, I can't describe to you what it's like. I mean, I could tell you if I knew the facts, how deep it was, you know, how far down and how wide it was across, but that might not help you at all. But if I tell you, you know, it's greater than whatever, that kind of helps. But now you're, you know, you're using illustrative and figurative language. The other thing parables are is that Jesus sent them, they were very, very commonplace for the people. Now there's what he talked about, they knew. This was things from their lives that they were very, very familiar with. Some of it we are, some of it we aren't as you move on. Um, so they, you need that's extra things that need to be interpreted. Let's begin now with, uh, as uh, as our study guide says, Mark 4. If somebody would like to read 1 through 9, that would be awesome. Another time Jesus began to teach by the sea. Such a large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it with, out in the, on the sea. The whole crowd was on the seashore. Then he taught them many things in parables. As he taught them, he said, Listen, there was a sower who went out to sow. As he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up right away because it did not have deep soil. When the sun rose, it was scorched, and because it did not have much root, it withered. Some seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, so it did not produce fruit. Still other seed fell on the ground, a good on good ground, and yielded fruit, sprouting and growing and producing a crop, some thirty, some sixty, and some one hundred times as much as the sow. Then Jesus said, Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Very good. Reset my sharing so I can see everybody. There's everybody else. <laughs> you lost stuff. There you are. It's just doesn't want to cooperate. All right, let's try it again. 
There we go. All right. I don't know if that makes a difference for you at home, but it makes a difference for no. me. Now I can see you better. And let's get my scripture back on the screen. Well, I guess that's going to have to work. All right. Question one, what did Jesus exhort the people to do in verse three? Listen. Yes. <laughs> Listen up. In fact, this is a command. So pay attention. Would be another way you can translate this. That's why the exclamation point is there. Listen, y'all. <laughs> and then why why was that necessarily go to verse nine? What does Jesus say in verse nine? Pastor, Here. Will you turn off the ice machine? Sure. What did he say in verse nine? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. What does that mean? We all have ears. Pay hey, attention. I guess pretty much. Yes. We all have hears, but do we often want to hear? No. Uh, Mike, does Aaron want to hear? No. no. And that's the difference. Not only is Jesus telling you to listen, but hear what comprehend. Yeah. Listen and learn what I'm saying. Listen to the words. What are some reasons why people, especially when you're trying to tell people about Jesus? Why would they who have ears not want to listen to you? Well, they don't believe. Right. They don't believe. Maybe they think they already know what you're going to say. And it doesn't make a dang bit of difference. You have your God. You have your thing. Even if it's not about God, if you're maybe just trying to tell them, Mike, how to fix a car. I already know. There's that attitude, isn't there? Or they believe that the Bible and you don't have anything to say to them. Not going to make a difference in their life. It means nothing. Well, they believe in God and they don't feel like they have to go to church. Yeah. Study. You can have your God, Bill, and I'll have mine. Okay. Yeah. This is a kingdom parable, meaning it tells us about what the reign and rule of God is like. And what is the premise? What is the story that Jesus is telling? What is the setting? people hear but don't really believe it yeah but this parable that he told he, he's trying to Garden. trying to say that some things are received but uh for now don't, don't for now don't interpret it just give no. me what is the story going on what is what is the story that he's telling sowing he's seeds planting planting it's agriculture right something that would be very very familiar to these people a lot of times in parables, you want to look for things that would stand out in a story. Things that the, make the people of that time go, wait a minute. What, what was that? It'd be like me telling you, I was <coughs> in the parking lot. I saw this big, huge elephant. And you go, wait a minute, what? <laughs> because in that moment, Jesus is giving them the meat. I mean, that's an important part of what he's telling them. That's the listen up moment. So for the most of this, it, it makes sense. Except, how many of you guys plant gardens? Yeah. <laughs> Not too much anymore. No. Back when you did, how careful were you planting your seeds? Very yeah. careful. Why? Make sure it was in good soil. And no squirrels or anything got it. It's fertilized. Because what was true about the amount of seed that you had? Limited. And if you were just careless with it, you'd have to put out a lot of money to buy some more. So you want to be very careful. The planter here who is sowing the seed, how careful is he? He just no. sowed it everywhere. Wouldn't that make you in the story go, hey, <laughs> wait a minute, what's going on with this here? That don't make any sense. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't. The other part is in verse 8. For the good seed that lands on good soil, what kind of a crop does it produce? Good seed. Good, good um, crop. Abundant crop. Have you guys ever planted a garden and had 30, 60, or 100 times as much as what you sowed? We nope. planted nope. three squash plants and had over 30 squashes. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's that's amazing though, isn't it? <laughs> How about what if you had a hundred? You seen? all would get two. <laughs> <laughs> Here's another example that would make people go, wait a minute, how could that happen? How could there be such a uh, such a wonderful yield of all this, right? So there's another point. Jesus is uh, that and you only you only got a certain amount of land too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's move on to our next question. Question two. No, do I want to go there? Yeah. Question two. Um, we're going to read uh, fourth uh, chapter verses ten through twelve, and look at what is the secret of the kingdom of God, and to whom has the secret been revealed, and from whom it is hidden. So back to Mark, and let's read verses ten through twelve. Somebody would like to do that for me. I will. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables, and he said to them. To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see, but not perceive, and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. Good. So this whole idea of the reign and rule of God or the kingdom of God is, as uh, Bonnie's translation said, it's a, what does it call it? Not mystery, but a... A secret secret or a mystery secret, secret yes and like now that. why would that be people were i mean this involves the messiah they knew the messiah was bringing some kind of a kingdom i mean that's what was promised to david that the messiah would reign on david's throne he would assume david's throne and it would last forever so what kind of a kingdom were they looking for earthly kingdom what kind earthly kingdom very good. Yeah, exactly. Sitting on an actual throne in Jerusalem and all other nations come and bow. So once again, God's people are lifted up and everybody else is brought down low. And if anything, if they're left alive, they're servants. If you're Rome, of course, that's the kind of kingdom they were looking for. That kind of, kind of kingdom Jesus has come to bring. Pastor, I don't understand. Excuse me, I don't understand. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. It's like they what want a brick and mortar. What, what do you need Otherwise to be they might, forgiven? They might turn and be forgiven. What What do you What do you need to turn and be forgiven? What has to happen for you? If we're all born in the devil's reign and rule, what has to happen for you to be transferred into Christ's kingdom and be forgiven? Repent. Holy Spirit and faith. So this is not going to come by Jesus outwardly saying, hey, guess what? I'm the Messiah, and it's not going to be the kind of kingdom that you want. He's not going to come right out and say that. You're going to pick that up by faith, through the Holy Spirit, through his word. It's not going to be readily available for anybody that does not have faith. Otherwise, it's hidden. Part of that is how he's going to present it, but part of it is you're not going to get it unless you have the Holy Spirit. You can't understand it. You're going to be too focused on this whole idea of an earthly kingdom where Rome is gone and you're lifted up and ruling. The kind of kingdom which if Jesus hadn't done anything else but do that, it's good while he's alive. Once you die, you're... Good question, so, though. I was wondering, because I like to... I, I think I kind of get what you're trying to ask. Like, is Jesus saying that if they turn from him saying that that parable or talking about that parable, they'll be forgiven if they do turn away. He is he is saying things in parables um, so that it's only by the Holy Spirit that you get it. Um, what he's really saying is otherwise they might turn and be forgiven is you're not going to do that unless the Holy Spirit does it for you. You can't choose to do that. He can describe what he's come to do and it's not going to mean a dang thing to you unless the Holy Spirit gives you faith. All the words describing how wonderful eternal life is and what Jesus came to do or who he is, is uh, you in the world is not going to mean anything without the Holy Spirit's work. You're not, and even if you can understand it in a way you could pass a test, it's not going to mean anything to you. He's not going to be your Lord and Savior. 
unless the Holy Spirit works that faith in your heart. That's the only way you can grasp onto it. They can't turn. And they can't be forgiven. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. But in the mystery of the gospel, in the mystery of faith, even though it's the Holy Spirit that worked that faith in your heart, you didn't choose Jesus. He chose you. Some people can say no throughout their entire life, and we don't understand why. That's the mystery of faith. If you have faith, you have eternal life. It's all God's work. You didn't do anything. He turned you. He converted you. If you die without faith, it's all on you. Chances are the gospel was laid in your lap and you said, you know what? I don't need this for whatever reason. I don't want Jesus. I don't want, I want to earn my salvation. I don't believe that there's a God. I don't want to change my life. Whatever the I don't want it is, you refuse it. Okay. Good question. Go back to our study guide here. And if you have questions, please pop up and ask. So, so we see that a necessary ingredient for properly understanding parables is faith. Got to have faith to understand them. To those who refuse to believe, the parable remains obscure and Jesus' message is hidden from them. Parables have the double function of teaching those who are willing to learn and keeping the secret hidden from those who would only scorn it. We have seen these two responses to Jesus previously in Mark, and they're illustrated in the parable of the sower. Where was the last time you saw this response to Jesus? What if it was something we studied last week? He just was at a banquet. Oh. Well, blind and, and whose know. house was he at? The tax collector. Yeah. yeah. And how did the tax collector respond to Jesus? He's sitting at his tax booth, and what happens? Jesus calls him. He follows him. Yeah. Because he all of a sudden decided, yeah, I think this Jesus is better than collecting taxes. <laughs> no, because Jesus called him. And if there was any realization, it happened by the Holy Spirit who opened his eyes to this Jesus is better than what this temporal wealth that I've got. If not for the Holy Spirit, who would ever choose temporal wealth over following some rabbi that's wandering around and doesn't have a home? And, uh, <laughs> who were the ones that uh, saw some of the same things that the disciples in Matthew saw, yet were scorning Jesus at that dinner? Look, he eats with tax collectors and sinners. Who was saying that? Right. They saw the same thing that Matthew saw and the disciples saw. But what didn't they have that Matthew had? And the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit. Not going to make a difference to them unless you have that. It's hidden from you. Excuse me. Question three. Read Jesus' explanation of the parable in uh, verses 13 mm -hmm. to 20. What is the word that the farmer sows? What things are hidden? Uh, that word is taking, uh, what things hinder that word from taking root and producing soil in people's lives? What is illustrated by the seed that falls on fertile soil? So what Jesus is going to do is that parable of the sower. He's with the disciples now. And one of the things this video illustration didn't do very well, I think, is um, Jesus is saying this to them when nobody else is around. I get the idea that they're not the same He's teaching the parable to the public. They're off on the side. Maybe they're in the house. But anyway, uh, pick it up with verse uh, 13. Somebody read uh, verses uh, 13 to 20, please. Then he asked them, do you not understand this parable? How often will you understand any of these parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and immediately takes away the word and that was sown in them. Some are like the ones sown on rocky ground. As soon as they hear the word, they immediately welcome it with joy. Yet, since they have no root in themselves, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they immediately fall away. Still others are sown among the thorns. These are the ones who hear the word, 
but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth and desires of other things enter in and choke the word so it becomes unfruitful. One more verse, 20. But the ones sown on good ground are those who hear the word, accept it, and produce fruit, some 30, some 60, and some 100 times as much as it was sown. Jesus starts in verse 13. Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand any of the parables? Well, how is it that they're going to understand? What did we say before? The Spirit. Only by the Holy Spirit. Doesn't matter how smart you are. You can be intelligent Pharisees that know the law inside and out. Not just the law. You know all these man-made laws, and it's not going to make a difference. It's not going to help you. It's only the Holy Spirit. So the key is in verse 14. What is what is the seed? Store, store. Word. 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 And word are we talking about? Word of God. Yes. And as good Lutherans, we understand the word being two different parts. What is God's word made up of? Gospel. Law and gospel. Law and gospel. And you know, really, we think about the gospel, but without the law, gospel doesn't do anything. So this is the entire witness of God that is being sown, I think. And then we have a couple different reasons why that that word doesn't take root. And, and when we talk about soil, I think the best way to look at that is people's hearts. That's where the word is sown, isn't it? It's sown in your heart. So the first uh, problem Jesus uh, explains is what? What's wrong with a person's heart in verse 15? The devil comes. What well, says that they're sown along the path? be the problem going back to the actual parable what's the problem with the soil on a path it's a, word, it's hard. Hard. It's a hard soil okay. it needs to be worked up for the okay. seed to get in there so why is satan able to come along immediately in some people and snatch that word what's the problem with their heart hard. Hard. what does it mean spiritually when somebody's heart is hard they're dead well, they're dead they don't believe they don't want to accept it very good. They haven't been broken by the law. They're all about themselves. To quote a sermon not too long ago, we're all turned in on ourselves. That's the way you're born. And that's the problem I have occasionally, and that's probably the problem you have. When you're focused on yourself, your heart is hard, and you don't care about anybody else, you first. And then if it works for me, I'll care about Ron. Otherwise, I don't have time for Ron. I'm focusing on me. That's the kind of heart. And if the gospel comes at that point, they're not going to listen. It's all about me. Only if it helps me. I don't want the gospel to help me because, well, Jesus comes not just to be my Savior, but he comes to be my Lord. And if I don't want a Lord ruling my life, I got no chance or I don't care about a Savior. And Satan's right there to point me back to the world. You don't need that, Jesus. It's one of the favorite things. Just do some good works. Just keep working hard. Help people. Love people. That's the key. You'll work your way in the kingdom. <laughs> Will you? Mm -hmm. Go down that path. And the final question is, how many good works does it take? More than you can do. And for every good work you do, you have a ton of evil things that stand against it. Verse 16, what's the second problem when the word is sown? You welcome it. They don't have the root. Right. So what kind of heart are we talking about here? What actually happens to the seed in this one? It doesn't take root. It, it does. Well, it goes in. It does. It doesn't last. But it, it does. Out, it does. Soil. Because in verse 17, what happens? They have no root in themselves. Only less. And what comes along? Trouble. Trouble in the immediate. Oh, persecution. Away. No, we don't have that happen in the world, do we? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's all around. <laughs> Every day. It happens to everybody, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> when you become a Christian, when you're baptized, you start believing, extra trouble comes your way because Satan doesn't like it. And the world doesn't like it. Persecution is especially going to come to you. So what this is talking about is somebody that doesn't have root. You've got faith, but it doesn't grow. You're baptized and you never come back. I don't need to worship with them. I can stay at home. 
I can stay at home and worship by myself. I can go out in the trees and I can read the Bible on my own and I don't need to be part of church and I don't need the sacrament. I don't need this. I don't need that. I don't even need baptism. But they need the Lord's Supper. You need the Lord's Supper. You need the fellowship of believers. You need to go to worship gospel. You need to worship and you need to grow in the word. You need to do what you guys are doing right here. This is how you work up the soil and you let the roots go down deep as you listen to Jesus. And we talk about it and we apply it to our life. And if you are removed for some reason from that fellowship, it's a hard life. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's hard to keep that faith without the fellowship of believers. Mm -hmm. How hard is it for you? And, and all of you are regular worshipers here and you're in regular in Bible study. When troubles and problems come along, how hard is it for you being faithful believers? Like very it's hard. hard. It's hard. It's, it's hard. very hard. Imagine how hard it is for somebody that cuts off the work of the Spirit through the means of grace, through Bible study, through baptism, through the sacrament of the altar. Imagine all that. That's what we're talking about. Verse 18, still others are thrown or sown among thorns. And what does Jesus say these thorns are? What's the idea behind that? Verse 19. For it's a life to see someone of wealth and desire. All word or effect. Or other things. Anything that can choke out the truth of the world. Which makes sense. I mean, if you've ever planted anything, is it going to grow if it's surrounded by weeds that are pulling pulling nutrients from the soil that that, that oh, seed needs? Oh, well. And the weeds were a lot quicker than this. Oh, just yeah. The words that seeds seem to like to grow quicker than yeah. <laughs> how how is this a problem in our life wealth and the desire for other things the things that the world holds precious how big of a problem is that for you it's a distraction it is i think it's a problem for all of us Amen. it may be bigger for me than it is for somebody else but i think it affects all of us yeah. because there's always that shiny thing that we want and well, I'm not saying that very well, but no, you are. I mean, there's always, and we should be looking at God and we should be in church, not fishing and whatever. <laughs> the uh, sleeping <laughs> our heart, it would be a great thing if when we came to faith, our heart was immediately we got rid of all that sinful heart and those desires that we have, but it's still there. And your life as a Christian is war right? Mm -hmm. Between you, 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 the, the new heart that the Spirit creates, which holds to Jesus, and our old sinful heart that holds to us. And we constantly have that battle, and I'm sorry, people, but that's going to continue in your life till the day you die, or till the day Christ raises you from the dead. It's going to go on. And for those that don't let the Spirit work in their life, once again, that I don't make take advantage of His work through the means of grace, through Bible study and the sacraments, the world's going to take overtake you. If all you're going to do is come here and spend an hour, an hour and a half in worship on Sunday, how many hours does the world have to work on you? All the rest of them. All the rest. And it works hard. And especially with, with the means, TV is very pervasive. Yes. And so is the internet. Mm -hmm. And so is the internet. And the world is so anti-Christ these days, it's even harder. How about right now in this election season? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What is being sown in your heart from everything that you watch? And I don't care what candidate you have or what political party you're you're affiliated with. When you watch the stuff on TV, what's sown in your heart? So get a lie to the other. What they, lie? What they what lie about? Anger. 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 It's mm -hmm. them. Ron's one of them. Okay. He's one of them. Why is everybody always picking on you? He's in my He's an easy mark. <laughs> yeah, that's good nature. We were going to talk about this this morning at 10 o'clock. We didn't get there. We'll get there next week. But uh, there are things as a church we should focus on issues, but I will never focus on candidates. Yeah. Focus on issues and what the Bible has to say about issues. There is no Christian party. The Republicans aren't a Christian party. The Democrats aren't a Christian party. And as Christians, the issues that they support, we have problems with both of them. But that's what's sown in our hearts. I mean, and it's very prevalent. And if you've watched anything, I don't care if it's debate or political ads, that's being sown in your heart. 
And we forget that I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican, you're, you're beloved of the Lord. He loves you. You're a Christian. Even if you're not a believer, you're a Christian. You've had the wool pulled over your eyes. You're not the enemy. The enemy is Satan. You're somebody that needs the love of Christ. And you need my patience and understanding. I may not be able to support some of the issues that you're that you're going to support, especially if it involves killing children, the unborn. I can't support that. But I love you. And I'm not going to call you names. And I'm not going to shove you out of my perimeter. And, and God forbid, unless you're posting really nasty stuff, I'm not going to kick you off my Facebook page. You need some of the things that I produce. I seen a picture on Facebook of a shirt, and it's got the Republican and Democrat, the donkey and whatever, elephant. And in the middle, it says, I'm not with either party, I'm with the lamb. Yeah. It's got the lamb. Oh, very good. I love yeah. that. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. That's why I keep saying it doesn't matter who's elected in November, who's ruling. Christ is on the throne. So, so then you finally have the good ground where all of this is produced. And what's the difference with the soil or the heart then? It's been worked up by the gospel. The Spirit has worked it up. He's broken that individual so that they understand that they can't handle life on their own. They need Christ. Yes. So, Holy Spirit's able to work faith. And once faith is worked, then you accept Christ. But, you know, that's a big, I don't like to use the word accept because that's used outside of our, in, in kind of the decision theology. Have you accepted Christ yet? Well, has the Holy Spirit worked faith in your heart yet? <laughs> yeah. It's only after you have faith can you start accepting or following him or believing in him or choosing to do good works. It's only after that faith has been worked. Before that, you're never going to choose anything to do with Christ. Questions or comments? Okay. Well, he chose you. You yes. didn't choose him. Correct. Yeah. And we always hold on to that as 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 a, as a belief. Whenever we start talking about conversion or how people come to faith, you didn't choose Christ. He chose you first. And once you've once he's chosen you and planted faith in you, can you make choices for him? You can choose whether you come to church or not. Mm -hmm. You can choose whether to come to Bible study or not. You can choose whether to come up to the altar for the Lord's Supper or not. However, if you choose <coughs> no one things, you're going to find the Holy Spirit knocking on your heart because he knows when you start choosing not to use the means of grace, you have a chance of falling away and he doesn't want to allow that to happen. So he'll come chasing after you like the hound of heaven. And once you miss Sunday, once you miss last Sunday, next Sunday's easier. It is. It's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pretty true. Good stuff. Let's uh, continue on. And uh, we're asked to read verses 21 to 23 of Matthew chapter 4. I can get somebody to read verses 21 to 23. He also said to them, A lamp is not bought out to be put under a basket or under a bed. It, it is its place or on a lamp, isn't its place on a lamp stand, where there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed, and nothing concealed that will not come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. He, no, nope. that's it. Right there, just those three verses. So this can be a little bit confusing, right? All of a sudden, Jesus is talking about a lamp stand and things like that. Keep in mind, in the context, what were we talking about with parables? We we're talking about some can understand and some can't, right? For some, it's hidden. For some, it's revealed. Jesus is mentioning another little parable here that illustrates that. Although it says on our study guide, although Jesus' identity is revealed now only to the eyes of faith, it will not remain hidden forever. This parable looks to the end of history when Jesus will be revealed to all his glory to everyone. So the lamp that's not put under a basket that's placed on a lampstand is Jesus. He's come to be that lamp on a lampstand. Unfortunately, for many who don't want anything to do with him and to shun the gift of grace and the gift of faith, he is like a lamp that's put under a basket. That's for now. That's the reason for the parables for now. But there's going to come a day when nothing is hidden that will not be revealed. And anybody want to know when that day will be? When all is revealed? Judgment day. Judgment day. Finally. When every knee will bow and all will believe and understand that he is the Lord God. 
some to their eternal detriment and punishment, some to their eternal glory. We don't know. Everyone will know. Hmm? We don't know. Everyone will know. And some might say, where did I make a big mistake? Yeah. Hmm? There will be many that say that. Is the church. And Jesus is, is, is a lamp shining out through the gospel, right? Through the gospel mm -hmm. testimony of him. As the church, how are we supposed to be part of that shining out of him now? Well, then the world tell people teaching others. We are supposed to be shining out who he is and what he's come to do through our what? words and our actions. Yes. We build each other up in that faith when we gather here to send us out individually, but also to do things as a church. And what what is this about thinking about that last day? Why is it an imperative for us to do this? What's going to happen on that last day for people that have not seen the light of Christ? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Eternal. Yeah. And it's too late for them. Yeah. They're going south. They're going south. So before they go south, now is now's our time to do what we can. Knowing that uh, we'll cover this in a little bit, but all we're asked to do is sow the word and the Holy Spirit does the rest. Let's motor on that. Questions or comments? I think we'll get to that in another section. Um, we're supposed to read verses 24 to 25 now. Ron wanted to do it, but I stopped him. So Ron, if you want to read verses 24 to 25, that last section there. You will not to tell them, pay attention to what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you, and more will be given to you. Yes, whoever has will be given more, and who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Keep in mind, this is still setting in an idea of how parables reveal truths to some, but not to others. So, uh, when he talks about the same measure you use, it will be measured to you and more will be given. Um, who do you think the ones where more will be given to? Believe it. Yeah. The ones that understand what the parables are saying because they have faith. The same measure of faith that you've been given that you use in your life. And we do use faith, right? We use faith to believe. With the same measure that you believe more will be given to you. So what is it, if we're talking about faith and believing, what is it that's going to be, what more is it going to be given to you? Yeah. Or what does Jesus have to get? What are you gaining from this Bible study? Knowledge. What? Knowledge. knowledge. And from that knowledge, what else happens? Faith increases. Faith stronger, stronger faith, faith, right? More you use what Jesus has given you, his word and the knowledge and the faith building, stronger your faith gets. And sometimes that strength happens when he throws trouble come into your life. So you're encouraged, man, I, I really need to hold, I, I need God's word. I need to hear his wisdom on this because I just don't know what to do. I need to sit down and hear what my brother or sister has to say because I don't know what to do. I don't know how people who have no faith or who have very little faith get through their troubles. Well, because he's somebody we can talk to. He's some, he's someone that we can throw all our problems on. And I find just sharing them makes them lighter. Yes. How do they get by? Drugs, alcohol, gambling, porn, overeating, adultery. Worshiping anybody, anything and anybody else. I mean, you turn to the world. Uh, we had explained this way. If you don't believe in God, then you're faced with the ultimate end. I mean, what is your end? What happens when you die? Eternal damnation. No, you don't believe in that. Oh, oh. well, you may be surprised. <laughs> you know, that's where you'll find yourself. You, there's nothing. You end, and that's it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might have this fancy notion, well, at least I'll go on in people's memories, really. For how long? How long? Right. Yeah. One generation. Maybe not even that. So all that in people that don't believe there's a God, all that sits there. And they don't want to face it. 
So what do you do? Uh, what do a lot of people do when they bad things happen? They don't want to face. They go to the mall and you go shopping. Mm -hmm. So so picture this kind of idea metaphorically or, or uh, as a, as an example. You go to the mall of other things to find to focus your attention on: sports, gambling, drugs, porn, yourself, your family, your kids, your involvement in whatever. All of these are things that you saturate your life in so you don't have to think about this thing you don't want to think about. Well, <coughs> you're done. <coughs> you're done. <coughs> but all of those are temporary. Yeah. Because when you think, oh, I feel bad, I'm going to go to Joanne's and buy $100 worth of scrapbooking paper. Next year, it's on the garage sale. Yeah. <laughs> and what happens when, yeah. when you finally reach the end and you have a chance to think about it when you're on your deathbed? You did the wrong choice. You realize none of those things meant anything. Go, go take them with you. That's the way the world thinks. If you think there is no God, then why would you think there's a heaven or hell if there is no God? And when you die, that's it. You're done. <laughs> Sorry. Bye-bye. Gone and forgot. How depressing is that? Yeah, right which is why you'll spend your life focusing on anything and everything else other than that. Because you don't want to go there. But you know what? You can't avoid it because eventually you're going to go there. So what do we have to tell those people? There is a God. And there is more. In fact, there's something wonderful. And it's a God that doesn't want you to be locked out. He wants you to be with him now and forever. And his name is Jesus. And he came to die for you. And he's Take really not sins. asking for much when you think about it. Just to believe. Live and he, he his gives, law and his word. He gives you the power to believe. Right. He does it all for you. Which really, in the scheme of things, is not much to ask for. That's why, for us being lights shining out in a world, the world is already dark. And you just need to come alongside people and listen to them. And... Look for those areas that are really dark and they're struggling with. And that's the law already working in their heart. And then uh, you can give them the gospel. Yeah, this world is pretty hard. And there is a lot of hate out there. You know, if you hear people complain about the political ads and everybody lies and there's a lot of hate and agree with them. Yeah, it is. But you know something? There's, there's something better. There's something that's more important than political parties. Yes, this world is divided, but there's somebody that can reunite it, if not now, in a better place to come. And there's your gospel. But you got to admit, you got to let the law work. You got to admit where they're at. And right now, without Christ, it's hopeless. Let them see that. Let them dwell on that. But don't leave them there, if you can help it. Okay. So whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Who are those people that don't have? Yeah. And they might have a, a whole bunch of earthly wealth, right? But as we said, when you die, what happens to that? It's gone. Yeah. The government takes it. The government takes it. You don't take it with you. No, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. What, what about if you have, uh, if you're famous, like you were president or something, or you were a famous actor? Doesn't that matter? No. You can't take their money with them either. Okay. If they have any. Accolades. <laughs> the accolades, all the honor? No, it doesn't mean crap. Uh, they don't have any belief, but that's the only one. Mm -hmm. So everything you have, whether it's material or non material, if you don't have Christ, it's all taken away in the end, isn't it? That's what Jesus is saying. If, okay. you have, if you have faith, and you let the Spirit work and nurture that faith, you get more. You get more understanding. You get stronger faith. When you came to this church, what did, what did you receive that you didn't have before you got here? Oh, forgiveness. Oh, forgiveness. What else more tangible, more real? For us, Christian friends. What? Christian friends. Yes. Friends. Family. Friends family. I felt Sacrifice. I felt welcome at your home. Brothers and sisters in Christ. You gained that, didn't you? Mm -hmm. And you know what? When you die, 
Will they all disappear? No. No. You'll be with them forever. Mm -hmm. They'll always be there. Don't say goodbye. You say see you later. Sorry, Ron. See you soon. See you later. Oh, oh not yeah. too soon. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Whoever has will be, you understand where Jesus is getting uh, all, all the different ways this matters. What you have, you'll receive more. Yes. Good. Any uh, comments or questions? I just, I mentioned this earlier, but it always is on my mind. I just don't see how people who have no faith can deal with trouble because you can sit there. And God knows when we're mad at him. He knows when we're angry, we can sit there and spit and sputter and yell and relieve ourselves because he took it off. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, uh, we didn't make it through chapter four, but that's okay. We had some good discussion. I'm not going to motor on. I thought maybe we could get to chapter five, but there's a lot of other things to do. So I think we'll leave the rest there. And we'll pick it up in chapter four uh, when we come back next week on October 9th. And uh, I'll set up the video so that we maybe see this part onward and take it from there, okay? Any final thoughts from all of y'all at home? Good yeah, study? Keep the faith. I'm not at home, but I know some friends that I've had and they die and there's no funeral, there's no nothing. It's nothing, nothing, no, no. And it's just like, yeah, it's just the fun. It's just one of the phones. You know, I'm thinking, yeah, I had a cousin that died. It was a second marriage and the wife wouldn't do anything with the real, the, the first family. And she wouldn't even tell them where he died. So they had a party. Yeah. Had a, I guess you'd call it a wake. And they, they something. Yeah. They um, you know, did it all on their own because she wouldn't cooperate. What a way to end his life. Isn't or to it, memor to to memorialize him, I think would be better. Isn't it hard for a pastor to give a funeral for somebody that doesn't believe? Yep. Um in my experience, as I was, I've been taught, and as it's played out in my ministry so far, I don't talk a lot about them. I mean, what's to say? If I'm going to be honest, I'm going to say, you know what? I don't know where they're at. They really don't. So uh, I might mention a few things, but I'll I'll talk more about I'll talk to you, these people that are here now. Mm How -hmm. would you know what to say? Just give them long gospel. I mean. They're, a little bit. I mean, when, when you're at a funeral, especially if there's a casket there, here's the law right in front of you. This is your end. Once again, this is what you've been spending all your life in that. Preparing for. No, well, you have been preparing for, hiding from, running from, by filling your life with everything else. But here's the end right here. But there's more than this. Christ wants more than this for you. It depends on the situation, but that's kind of what I've done. I don't talk a lot about the deceased. I don't know. Well, you know, after my mom died, and they had broken away from, from church, and I know she was a believer, but they didn't yeah. go to worship or anything. And when she died, we had trouble finding somebody to do her funeral. Uh, we finally uh, got back with the Presbyterian Church, and uh, the pastor there then, she was wonderful. She did a very good job. But I came away there feeling empty. And something inside me kept saying, Jeannie, if anything, have a Christian burial. I want a Christian burial. And it did still to this day. I, I just feel that my life is meaningless if it don't end with that Christian burial. If they just bury you, nothing. See, but the way my son is, that's the way it can end up. So all of you, <laughs> if you hear when I've died, <laughs> don't let that happen. You know, I, I thought the same thing because my son does not, you know, I, I think he's a believer, but, you know, even when he was here, he wouldn't come to church with me Sunday. I came by myself. That's I don't want to be taking his inventory. I got to just worry about myself and take, but mm -hmm. I'm thinking also, 
I want a Christian burial. You know what, by gosh, by golly, I gotta, I've got to trust. And I just thought to myself when you were talking, I'm going to put that in my trust. I'm going to have a Christian burial with or without my family because I've got a family right here and they can, you know, they can just stick it. Make your wishes known as best you can. We're going to have, uh, Tim's working on having something coming up where somebody from, uh, I believe it would be Sharp's Funeral Home comes and talks about funeral planning. Uh, but also he'll talk about uh, trusts and making your last wishes known kind of thing. Yeah, we're going to try to cover all that. Well, there'll be an attorney here. If it is sharp and not Swartz, they're very good. Yeah. Of course, I'm sure Swartz is too. But yeah. Yeah, it is Swartz. Yeah. Sharp's is what they reached out to him. I think you not, might have a connection yeah. with them. I have a connection with both of them. Probably in Swartz. I don't have a yeah. will. I have a trust. If you trust, it might cost you a little bit more. But, it's but more keep it out of probate. Than, you want to yes, keep, yeah. keep your stuff out of And I don't mm -hmm. think it can be broke. No. But I can go in there and make changes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I have to go through all of yeah. that. Yeah. Because but, I am... but the kids can't come in and break yeah. it. Right. Yeah. Kids, you can go in and change it, but the kids can't. Yeah. But if you have more than one or two children, thank God my dad passed us clause that we were able to overrule my brother. From trying to take everything. I mean, it, just by he would go into the bank and start withdrawing money. For me, one of the hardest things is when what you've alluded to is when the family doesn't want a funeral. And it's hard for me, not because I've missed an opportunity. It is that. I mean, the funeral, whether you're a believer or not, it's a great opportunity to preach Christ. But I know if you don't have a funeral, there's no closure. So you don't understand yeah. what you're missing. You That's need right. that. The, the person that died doesn't care anymore. No. If they're a believer, they're with Jesus. But the people that are left, they need that closure. No. They need it so very badly. And if you avoid that. We not only had a closure with the memorial, we put Ken's urn in the back seat and we took him for a ride. <laughs> That's awesome. I like no. it. Good. We used to take my brothers, Gary, ashes out of the bookcase and family gatherings, and he got dusted, and mm -hmm. we don't talk to him. You know, he was. They're still a part of our life. Let's uh, let's close this up. I want to thank you for everybody, and uh, I'm going to say a short prayer, and then on page uh, 25 of your study guide. It, it's some stands that came to him. I know my faith is found, and we'll read through those. It's kind of a prayer to God and then close with the Lord's prayer. So let's pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, thank you for the study and everything that was discussed. Some of it was planned, some of it wasn't. Um, may the truth rest upon our hearts, that truth that you've revealed to us. The understanding we can get gain from the parables from Scripture, but also the realization and the, and the knowledge and the faith that the Holy Spirit works through his word our eyes have been open. Keep our eyes open. Keep us studying. Keep us keep growing our faith through the good times and the bad times. May we only and always rest and look to you, our Lord and Savior, for strength to make it through this life. And so together we read from, uh, I know my faith is founded, increase my faith in Savior, for a change seeks by night and day to rob me of this treasure. And take my hope of bliss away. But Lord, with you beside me, I think I'll be on this way. And led by your good spirit, I shall be unafraid. Abide with me, O Savior, in your faith bestow. And I shall bid the defiance to every evil fall. Together with our Lord and Savior, as far as we pray, our Father. For our be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Will lead us not into temptation, but will not be out of our evil. Mine is the kingdom, and the honor, and the glory, forever and ever. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Have a Thank good night. You. Night, guys. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. Bye. Hope to see all of you on Sunday.
rushed back here, same time, same place, October 9th, Wednesday evening. Yes, you are. I want to say real quick, I'm going to let you guys know. Every Sunday at 8 o'clock, I've been watching the new Chosen. Every Sunday at 8 o'clock. It's the new season out? CW, yeah. you know. So the new season is out? Yeah. Yes, I've been watching the uh, season four. Four, I mean, two, oh, we, we already, we did. We did four, right? Yeah. Oh, no. So season five is the new oh, one. Oh, then five. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.